Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for the webinar titled, Where Are We With Delta and What About Boosters? An update on COVID-19 vaccine research. My name is Dina Pimanova. I am the project coordinator for the NYU Langone Community Health Worker Research and Resource Center housed in the Department of Population Health at the NYU School of Medicine um, and supported by the NYU Langone Community Service Plan. Today's uh, event is hosted in partnership with the NYU Langone Vaccine Center, um, uh, NYU Community Engagement Alliance Initiative, NYU Community, uh, sorry, NYU CUNY Prevention Research Center, and the NYU h, &H Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Next slide, please. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to briefly go over some housekeeping. Everyone is on mute. The chat box is open for comments and sharing of resources. Please use the Q&A box to submit questions to the speaker. Uh, we will have time to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion. Um, the slides and recording will be made available. I will email those out as soon as possible. Uh, and please be sure to fill out the poll at the end. Uh, next slide. Our agenda for today includes a presentation in which we will learn about ongoing vaccine research related to long-term protection, waning immunity, boosters, and more. Um, this will be followed by a moderated Q&A. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm excited to welcome back Dr. Mulligan. Uh, Dr. Mulligan is the Division of Infectious Disease and Immunology Director in the Department of Medicine and Director of the NYU Langone Vaccine Center. He joined NYU Langone Health in 2018. He is a translational physician scientist who leads a research clinic and a research laboratory. He conducts vaccine clinical trials and clinical studies of emerging infections. He has studied HIV, Zika, Ebola, bird flu, the 2009 pandemic influenza and other infections with public health impact. He's now studying the novel coronavirus. I will also introduce our moderator. Uh, Rebecca Mead was born and raised in New York. She's a community health representative at NYU School of Medicine's Department of Population Health, working on the New York City Housing Authority Resident COVID Response Project. In this role, she conducts surveys and saliva testing for COVID-19 at NYCHA housing developments and community-based organizations. Uh, Rebecca has experience in finance and project management for advertising companies and has worked on advertising campaigns for Lego, Coca-Cola, and AstraZeneca. And lastly, I wanted to mention that Rebecca is currently serving on the CHW Learning Committee at NYU Langone Health. So welcome everyone. Uh, Dr. Mulligan, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Dina. Um, um, I wanna again thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this really important um, discussion. And I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started here in just one second. And Rebecca, I look forward to uh, working side by side with you in this, in this important event. Thank you very much, Dr. Mulligan. All right. Um, can you confirm you're seeing my screen, Dina? Yes. Okay, great. And I'll put it on show mode and we're about ready to get going. Um, let me get a pointer. Okay, so today, uh, what we really want to spend some time on in the in the presentation, and then more, you know, whichever direction the, the audience wants to go in the question time. Where are we with Delta? What about boosters um, and other updates on on vaccine research? Is the title for today. And at the Vaccine Center, we've been doing clinical trials since the very beginning. Um, starting on May 4th, we vaccinated the first person to, to receive a Pfizer uh, COVID messenger RNA vaccine, and we've been working ever since. And we'll tell you a little bit about current studies. So we're um, dedicated to protect and restore human health. Um, we're one of 10 NIH-funded vaccine and treatment evaluation units. So most of our work is NIH-funded. We also do some selective industry studies like the Pfizer trial. Um, we're part of the COVID Prevention Network or CoVPN. Um, uh, you can see the 10 dots where the 10 uh, VTEUs are. And in response to this public health emergency, we set up 
um, our main clinic in Manhattan, and then four satellites all over the city and in Long Island. So we have three clinics in Manhattan, the, the main campus, NYU, at Bellevue, at the VA, and we're also at NYU Langone Hospital, uh, Brooklyn, and NYU Langone Hospital, Long Island. And we've been doing vaccine research, vaccine clinical trials at all of these locations. And I'll just start to try to get us all generally on the same page. You know, how does a vaccine work? So it teaches the body to recognize invaders. You wouldn't send out a, a group of firefighters to fight a fire if they hadn't had a lot of training. And really a child's immune system, or in this case, when we have a novel pathogen like COVID virus that none of us have seen before, um, all of us, we have to train our immune system in order to fight off the virus to protect our health. So um, <clears throat> what happens is that we give something that looks like in some way the virus to the immune system. It's not the whole virus. It's just in fact, there's the red piece on the surface of the virus. The body sounds an alarm when it sees this and um, <clears throat> then there's memory. And then in the future, so after the vaccine, you establish memory in your B cells and T cells, and you have circulating antibody. In the future, when the virus, the real virus now showing this whole thing here, comes into the body, alarm has sounded again, and those lymphocytes and proteins like, like antibodies go into action. And, and the goal would be to um, either prevent uh, the disease completely uh, or to prevent severe disease. And, and you've probably heard a lot in the news right now that with waning immunity and with Delta, we are seeing breakthrough infections with vaccines. But the important thing is that they, um, for, for most healthy people, they're still protecting against uh, serious disease, hospitalization, death. Although with further waning, it's possible that you know, we're, we're gonna see some erosion of that. There are suggestions of that in data out of Israel. We'll talk a bit more about all of those things in a minute. So the vaccines uh, that are authorized in the US are three. Two of them are messenger RNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. So here are some fast facts. The messenger RNA technology is new, but it's actually been studied for decades. So it's new in terms of a vaccine being used uh, in, you know, in, in the public. Uh, but it's been studied for decades, uh, so it's not all that new, really. It's just that, it, frankly, you know, this was its moment, right place, right time, and the RNA has been incredibly effective against COVID. Um, they do not contain live virus. They cannot make you sick with COVID. There's no risk of causing uh, disease, COVID illness, in the vaccinated person. Uh, these vaccines have been studied in... Um, tens of thousands of people. They've been delivered to hundreds of millions of people now. And um, they have a really outstanding profile of um, benefit versus the risk of harm. Messenger RNA from the vaccine never enters the nucleus of the cell, and does not affect or interact with a person's DNA. So we're not changing the genetic code in the body or anything like that. The RNA is eliminated from the body. What the RNA is, is it's a message to the cell. Basically, we inject it into the muscle in the arm. It gets taken up into cells it, it, and immediately it messages the cell, cell to start making the spike protein, that one piece, that red piece of the virus, never the whole virus. And that then trains the immune system. You get your antibodies, your B cell, your T cell. Um, there are a few myths out there, and you know we don't really want to repeat the myths, I think, too much. But you know I can tell you that these vaccines do not make you magnetic. They do not. Uh, there are no microchips in the vaccines. Um, I'm sure there are other things out there, these falsehoods that are going around. Um, I wanted to just share with you the numbers of doses that have been given now. So. Uh, on my screen, at least, I can't quite see all of this, but Pfizer, over 100 million doses, uh, two dose regimens have been given. Imagine that. So 200 million doses. Moderna, about 70 million two dose regimens. And then remember the J&J, &J, which is not RNA. So these two 
Pfizer and Moderna are RNA vaccines, you know that. And then J&J &J is a different platform or type of vaccine. And it's a uh, common cold virus uh, called adenovirus. The virus has been disabled, it can't multiply. Um, all it does is delivers DNA of the spike. So very similar conceptually to the RNA where you deliver RNA and that messages the cell to make the spike. And then the firefighters start kicking in in the body and making proteins and antibodies and T cells, et cetera. In this case, we're just backing up one step. We delivered DNA and uh, many of you will remember DNA enco uh, it encodes for RNA, which is the message to tell the body to make the protein, like the spike protein. So these are the numbers of people now fully vaccinated uh, in the US. So you can see it's whatever that adds up to, probably close to 200 million. Now, having said that, we still have 65 million people in the US who are unvaccinated. And so we still have a lot of work to do, no doubt. Most of the hospitalizations and deaths, essentially all of them, not, not quite, but almost all of them are in unvaccinated people, uh, sadly. It's a preventable disease. It's a VPD, a vaccine preventable disease like measles, mumps, rubella, et cetera. Um, well, how effective is it? Well, it's extremely effective. You can see over here, over 90% estimated vaccine effectiveness. These are data from New York State earlier this year, but notice this, and now we're getting into this issue of waning, waning of immunity, waning of protection. We're starting to see a little drop in uh, vaccine effectiveness against infection. So this would be someone with um, a positive test and symptoms consistent with COVID. Um, um, and that's obviously concerning. We, we haven't seen huge numbers of people with serious disease. The breakthrough infections are mostly mild. But again, if we look to Israel, where they started their program three months ahead of most of the world, their vaccination program, they used mostly Pfizer, an RNA vaccine, they uh, have data that are suggesting that younger adults, those um, without immune suppression, they're starting to see some breakthrough infections that are serious. And I think that what US government and regulators and its advisors have decided is that we certainly need to boost older adults and those um, with immunocompromising conditions. Um, and we, we're not yet suggesting boosters for healthy young people but many people who have occupations or living circumstances are, are recommended for boosters. We'll, get, we'll show you the specifics of that in just a minute. But um, it, to me, it makes sense to, you know, why wait around until we see a whole bunch of serious infection and death if, if it looks like we're heading that direction with waning immunity, with the high level of, of infectiousness of Delta. Uh, and we'll say more about these things. So, Delta is a variant. It's a mutant of the original Washington or Wuhan strain. It has a few changes in amino acids, particularly in the spike protein, that, which is the protein that's in the, in the vaccine. Uh, it's, a, it's the protein that the virus uses to grab on to respiratory epithelial cells in the, in the nose and, and uh, in the lungs that the infection gets down in there uh, to infect cells. So it's, it's the receptor binding protein, if you will. And, if it mutates along potentially with other places that might mutate in the virus, um, you can um, often see you know, no change at all. Sometimes that, uh, that mutation, that change in nucleic acid RNA sequence, which translates into change in amino acid sequence can change the ability of the virus to spread, change the ability of the virus to be um, neutralized by vaccine antibodies, for example, or to be less sensitive to protection against vaccine, it could also cause more serious infection potentially. Um, and there's been a suggestion of that with Delta. So these mutations um, are something we do need to be very careful about and watching. Well, how do they mutate? So all viruses do this, particularly the RNA viruses, which don't have very high fidelity when they reproduce their genetic sequence. And so it's always happening. It's random. Just, you know, if, it, if, if one single RNA molecule changes um, and it, it can happen um, slowly or, or sometimes more quickly in certain virus types. And um, 
the more of these that accumulate, the more the virus potentially will change. And that then becomes a variant. And some of the variants, as I said, are no more harmful than the original, but some can be more infectious like Delta uh, or potentially what we would really fear would be a variant that would be much more deadly. Uh, we're not seeing that thus far. So when our bodies are faced with a new variant, our immune responses uh, from vaccination or a prior infection may be able to fight it off. But if it changes enough where it's no longer recognized, the virus spike protein is no longer recognized, for example, by antibodies or T cells, that then could um, lead to resistance to, uh, uh, from vaccine protection. So that's something that we worry about. Uh, Delta is, you know, it's slightly harder to neutralize with sera from vaccinated individuals, maybe two to three fold less uh, sensitive to, to antibody neutralization, but uh, it's not a huge level. And as long as we keep our antibody levels high, we seem to be able to handle the, this virus just fine. But it's when they wane and fall down that we're starting to see these breakthrough infections. Then we're protected against serious disease still by our T cells. Um, I think that the T cells job is to recognize cells that are infected with a foreign invader of virus, and then frankly, to destroy those cells, just like the immune system is supposed to recognize and destroy cancer cells in the body. Um, um, so both antibodies and the, the cellular immunity, T cells, B cells are important parts of our immune response. So Delta now is causing, so this variant was so good at spreading, so contagious, it basically took over. And it happened in the summer, starting in July, a little earlier, we started to see a little Delta. And frankly, within a month or uh, a little more than that, it's, it just really took over. And now it's basically everything we're seeing. It's at least twice as contagious as the original COVID. It may cause more severe illness. Um, the vaccines are probably a little less effective, uh, particularly with waning. Um, vaccinated people, therefore, can get breakthrough infections. I don't call these vaccine failures. They're not failures because although infection may break through, there's protection against serious disease, death, uh, hospitalization still. Um, vaccinated people can unknowingly transmit the virus to others. So just because you're vaccinated, uh, it, it's not a guarantee that you wouldn't give it to someone else. Although that is, a, you know, most of the time the vaccine protects. Remember, there's still, in that slide, I showed you the decrease in effectiveness. It was still very effective, um, uh, you know, 80, 90%, but it's maybe not 90% anymore. But um, one reason that I often will mention to people that are not sure they should get vaccinated is, look, you may think you're, you know, in good shape and don't need a vaccine for whatever reason. But think about those vulnerable people around you who may have a deadly infection if they get infected. They may not be able to respond well to a vaccine. Particularly, I have in mind older individuals, maybe grandparents in the family. And, and often there will be multi-generational um, housing situations. Pregnant women, if there are young women who are, are pregnant, um, they are, we know they're at, at risk. I've heard it said fairly recently that in some of the ICUs in uh, the southeast of our country where, you know, the hospitals are filling up with unvaccinated people, one in five of the patients in the intensive care units are pregnant uh, because being pregnant puts you at higher risk for severe COVID. So certainly we would encourage pregnant people to receive the vaccine, but also um, everyone around them should cocoon them. Uh, the same thing for grandma and grandpa. Should, we should cocoon them with vaccinated people around them to keep them safe so that we're less likely to spread. Um, and it's, it is the unvaccinated people that are at greatest risk. They're more likely to get infected, sick, and die from COVID than vaccinated people. So the national and international CDC, WHO health authorities track uh, variants around the world. And um, they do that by doing swabs and um, collecting the RNA and sequencing uh, the virus and looking at the sequence to see if 
as I described a minute ago, any, any mutations are there compared to the current dominating strain. So this is going on. In some ways, I'm a lot more worried about the future if we don't hurry up and get people around the planet vaccinated uh, than I am the current Delta situation, which you know we seem to be able to handle pretty well if we're vaccinated. Um, but I worry that a future variant might appear that would be much more resistant to protection provided by vaccination or be a real killer virus. In any event, the current Delta um, compared to the original strain showing here, which on average spread to maybe two or three people, this one is now spreading, we believe, to probably a higher number, at least twice as high, maybe four or five, six. We don't know for sure. It's hard to get these numbers, but... Um, it's, it's definitely much more contagious, and that's why it's taken over. Okay, let's talk about waning of immunity and vaccine protection and boosters. So who, who should get a booster shot? So these are recommendations that actually in the last week have now needed a little updating. So I'll try to update these as I, as I go through this. So if you're, if you're taking a screenshot, uh, you may wanna also write down a couple notes. So now, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J, uh, can all have boosters for certain uh, people. Uh, for, for Pfizer, I mean, for J&J, &J, it's pretty easy to say. Anybody who is 18 and over, who got a single dose, Johnson & Johnson, J&J, &J, or sometimes called Janssen vaccine, um, and it's been two months, can get a booster. And because of the mix and match, uh, approval also now through the FDA, through the CDC, you can get a booster with any vaccine that you want. It could be a, if you had a J&J &J originally, you could get a J&J &J boost or you could get a Pfizer or a Moderna. Um, we were very honored to participate in the mix and match study, which was the data set that FDA, CDC and their advisors reviewed. We presented our results to these bodies and, and it, this is the data they used to decide that it is safe, it is well tolerated, and you get a strong immune response if you do um, uh, with, with the mix and max approach. Okay, so that's J&J. &J. They're the easiest one, 18 and over, and it's been two months, you can get a boost with any of the vaccines. And in order to do that, you probably, if you wanted to get Pfizer, you'd have to find a place that's giving Pfizer. I don't think all of the vaccination sites are now gonna start carrying all three, most likely. So you'll still have to track down um, you know, a place that has the vaccine that you're interested in. People 65, so for Moderna and, and uh, Pfizer, so the, all of that I just said was about J&J. &J. Now Moderna and Pfizer, the two RNA vaccines, they're now identical in terms of boosters. Um, people who are 65 and older, residents in long-term care facilities should get vaccinated. People who are 50 to 64 that have underlying medical conditions that predispose to severe COVID, things like heart disease, uh, lung disease, liver disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, all of the things that we all know um, can lead to serious COVID if, if someone becomes infected. All of those folks, if they're 50 to 64, should get a, a vaccination. And, and this is six months after their original series of, of the RNA vaccine. So again, you had Pfizer and Moderna originally, and it's been at least six months. These are the groups that should get it, 65 and older and in long-term care or, or in long-term care, 50 to 64 with medical conditions, 18 to 49 with medical conditions also. So anyone 18 and over with a, um, one of those um, predisposing comorbidities, we call them, should uh, or may get vaccinated. And then anybody who's under 65, over 18, that has an occupation or uh, a housing institutional situation that puts them at, at risk for um, infection. So this would include teachers, uh, would include healthcare personnel, would include people residing in prisons or jails, uh, people living uh, in multi-generational families, I would say, um, dormitories, military, et cetera. Those are all also um, authorized to receive a booster. One important thing that on all of this that I've just said has just happened in the last 10 days or so. Prior to that, and this is the last thing I'll talk about with boosters, 
the FDA and CDC had authorized and recommended respectively boosters for immunocompromised hosts with either Pfizer or Moderna. So people whose immune system were weakened seriously like transplant recipients, those undergoing cancer treatment, people on very strong immunosuppressives for autoimmune conditions have already been authorized and been getting their booster shots. And it's just in the last uh, week or so that all of these additional groups are now eligible to get a booster. And the other thing, just to make it totally clear, I talked about Pfizer and Moderna there near the end. You can, if you had Pfizer or Moderna, you can get your booster. It's been six months and you're in these groups with any of the three vaccines. So the mix and match applies to Pfizer and B Moderna as well as J&J, &J, which I discussed earlier. So it's really, I think a good thing. Why is it a good thing, this mix and match? Well. There might be people who move and they originally got one vaccine, but in their new location, they only have the other vaccine. Um, there might be people who had a reaction that was significant to one of the three vaccines and now they uh, would be perhaps better to get a different vaccine. Um, let's say you are a nurse practitioner going into a um, nursing home to provide boosters in this way, you might only have to bring one booster rather than bringing all three because you could give the same one to everybody uh, instead of having to bring three different ones, which would be very difficult. Um, another example, um, maybe a young woman who originally got the J&J &J vaccine. And we've learned a lot in the last few months about a very rare, very rare, but serious uh, complication uh, that occurs mostly in, in uh, young women within the first week or 10 days after the first dose of a J, uh, well, the only dose of a J&J &J vaccine, and, and that is thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. And it might might make sense to some women to, to think about an RNA vaccine rather than the J&J &J for their, their booster, given that. Okay, so here's a quick summary of, of uh, COVID vaccines for children. So, so much is happening. Just yesterday, the advisory panel to the FDA voted 18 uh, for, no one against, and one abstention, so basically unanimous, to allow children five to 11 to receive um, a one-third dose of the Pfizer vaccine. It's been studied in about 4,000 children. Uh, it's shown to be safe, highly uh, protective, over 90% protection, works just as well in kids as in adults. They're getting 10 micrograms, one third of the adult dose of Pfizer, which is 30 micrograms. So a smaller dose for these smaller uh, humans. Now the FDA has to decide what to do with that advice. They'll probably accept it, then goes to CDC. By this time next week, children five to 11 in all likelihood, I'm sorry, it should be six to 11 there, would all likelihood would be eligible to get their vaccines. Um, so that's really uh, great news. Well, we already have vaccines for children 12 and up uh, from, from Pfizer. And, um, and just to kind of remind you, I told you that we vaccinated the first person to get a Pfizer on May 4th of 2020. By December, the Pfizer vaccine was authorized. A week later, the Moderna vaccine was authorized. It was a couple months later, the J&J &J vaccine was authorized. And um, it was uh, the 12 to 15 year old approval for Pfizer came in, in May. So a lot has happened. It's, it's unheard of to develop you know, vaccines from scratch in less than a year, but it was done um, and it, thank goodness. Well, with, with kids, if you notice back here, we started with adults and we only started studying in kids after we knew it was safe, well tolerated and effective in, in adults. So this is just kind of showing you, we do an age de-escalation when we uh, are developing vaccines that we'd like to use in children. First, we make sure safe in adults because children are considered um, vulnerable and we have to protect them. Uh, then we can de-escalate to older teenagers and then adolescents. And now we're kind of in this uh, grade school age. And th this is where the approval is likely to come next week right here. And then the studies are being done in the two to five year olds and the six to 24 month olds. So these, these two uh, might follow in a few months. 
I just am moving towards closure and want to mention our vaccine center studies that we're doing. We're doing a lot of COVID booster studies. Uh, we're doing um, actually an interesting uh, messenger RNA for flu. So, you know, that messenger RNA has been a phenomenal platform for COVID. Well, flu is, is another RNA respiratory virus for which we need a better vaccine. So we're doing that. Um, uh, we're, this is really important for the discussion. I mentioned pregnant people. We are documenting in pregnant and breastfeeding uh, uh, moms uh, and their babies that, that the vaccines are safe well tolerated and, and produce the kinds of antibodies and T cell responses that we think would be protected. I highly recommend vaccination for, for all pregnant women. They're very vulnerable. Um, and then we're also studying the COVID vaccines in those with weak immune systems. So these are some of the studies we're doing. Here's a, an example of one of our flyers. This is a for the flu messenger RNA study that I mentioned where we're enrolling older adults and we're currently enrolling for this if, if anyone uh, is interested. And I'll also mention that this mommy vax, it's called study, we're currently enrolling both in Brooklyn location and in the Manhattan location. So that's available for um, anyone who would like to uh, be a part of that study to help us increase confidence among pregnant people that the vaccine is a reasonable uh, thing to do. And maybe leaving you with a couple of thoughts as you talk with your clients and your patients and even family members, because I know you'll be looked on as the experts, um, just to think of vaccines as if they are seatbelts. So we get in a car, it's, it's like going out into the world, we put on a seatbelt. It's a preventive measure to keep us safe. Um, um, and, and so hand washing, wearing a mask, social distancing, these are all things that we do that are sort of like that. And vaccines also are, are part of the prevention. What we have to do that ahead of time, right? You get vaccinated before to keep you from getting sick. It's too late. We keep, we've all seen the news stories on TV of people who, well, I didn't get vaccinated. Now I'm sick in the hospital and I sure wish I had gotten vaccinated you know, because they're really sick. Well, it's too late at that point. Although once they recover, they should get vaccinated. So that's another key point. The vaccines do provide protection to people, uh, better protection compared to what's called natural immunity after infection. Um, and then the other part of this analogy is that medications are like airbags in your car. So they're deployed only after a problem has occurred. So yeah, we have some medications to treat COVID. Um, they're, you know, they're getting we're learning and they're improving. I still don't feel like we have great medications, but you really, you'd rather avoid this. You really wanna wear the seatbelt. So I think that's a um, useful way. To, all of the preventive measures need to be in place and, and we hope never to need the um, medications, uh, the, the, the airbags. So I wanna thank you very much. I've enjoyed sharing a few thoughts and I really look forward to the upcoming uh, discussion now and I'm gonna, Stop talking and stop sharing my screen. And Dina, if you're talking, you're muted. Thank you so much, Dr. Mulligan. I think we will begin the moderated Q&A with Rebecca now. Thank you, Dr. Mulligan, for sharing your knowledge on vaccines and how they work. Um, we have a lot of questions to go through. Um, let's see what we have here. Um, first question is, when you say that you aren't recommending the booster to young, healthy people, are you saying young, healthy people should not get the booster or that it's not necessary? Um, I was being kind of technical. It's not yet authorized by the FDA and the CDC. Um, if you're 18 and older um, and you had J&J, &J, you can get it if it's been two months. So there's young people that can get it only for the J&J, &J, regardless of anything else, just being 18 and older, two months. If you got Pfizer and Moderna, 18 and over, if you have one of the conditions you can if you have an occupation or an institutional living situation you can 
So uh, there's a few ways where you could be a young adult uh, and get it, but it's not authorized yet by the FDA for those who are uh, totally healthy. And that's because it's, you know, probably, probably isn't needed. Their immune systems are stronger. Maybe waning is less of a problem. They probably got vaccinated later because they were last in line because they were young and healthy. So there's several reasons. Now, I think it's one of those situations where it'll be reassessed and sort of stay tuned. Right now, we'll try to get the older folks vaccinated and it may well be when time passes that we'll be turning to the, those healthier, younger people. Thank you. Um, how would you address someone who is hesitant to receive the vaccine? And how would you speak to someone who believes the many conspiracy theories about the vaccines? Well, I'm so glad you asked this question. Um, so I have a five-step approach that I use. And, and you, I, I honestly, I didn't pay this person to ask this question, but I'm ready with the, my answer here. Um, so if you want to jot down one, two, three, four, five. First of all, I try to establish um, common humanity with them and, and say, yeah, gee, I'm so happy to be able to talk to you. And I know what you want is you want your children to be safe. You want your mom and dad to be safe. And so you're thinking carefully about this. So I, I'm, I'm really happy. That's exactly what I want for my grandkids and my family. And then second, find out, well, what is the specific concern? And then try to address it quickly. Not linger, don't repeat the myths. But if they say, well, I heard that the vaccine can make you magnetic, you can quickly <laughs> say that, well, you know, I've heard that too, but I can guarantee you that um, the vaccine does not, there's no, there's no metal in the vaccine. So that is untrue. Uh, and once you've addressed the concern as, you know, as quickly as you can, because all of this should be like two minutes, uh, the whole, all five points. The point number three is um, to um, quickly move to how serious this disease is. You know, it, it really, we've had now, um, I think it's seven, uh, 40, over 40 million infections and over uh, 700,000 deaths uh, in the US. We've had more deaths from this now than from the uh, 1918 flu. So this is our worst pandemic in history. It's a very serious thing. And, um, and then the fourth point is, but the good news is we have a vaccine that is safe and effective. It's a vaccine preventable disease. And um, many people around the planet have received it now, you know, over a billion people have been vaccinated, well over a billion. And, and we know that the safety uh, and protection are outstanding. Uh, and then point number five, as your um, healthcare educator, your coordinator today meeting with you to talk about this, I strongly recommend. So we know that um, the most important thing in a person deciding whether to receive a vaccine is a strong recommendation from a trusted uh, person. Uh, often it would be someone like all of you on the call that, that trusted uh, health educator or a coordinator or someone that they're interacting with at an agency that they have a relationship with, but often it's healthcare provider of some type. And so a strong recommendation. I would just want to finish by saying I strongly recommend that you get the vaccine. It's, uh, it's been shown again and again to have an excellent uh, profile of, of uh, benefit uh, versus the extremely rare risk of harm. Um, we really want to want you to be safe and protected. So that's my five point thing. That's how I would try to do it. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, is booster an accurate term for third dose of Pfizer or Moderna? Plotkin, for instance, argues these are three dose vaccines with the third being a finishing dose. What do you think? And is this more than just a semantic issue? Well, I, you know, I know Stanley and he and others have said this. Um, and, and another similar thing would be to say that with J&J, &J, maybe it should have been a two dose series all along. So yeah, we have other vaccines like some of the hepatitis B vaccines where you get zero, one, six schedule, zero, then one month then six months. And many of the childhood vaccines, they get multiple doses like that spread out over time. So yeah, the, the, um, I think, you know, 
we're learning as we go. It's a new infection, a new vaccine. We're moving fast. And um, it was really important to deploy the vaccine that we knew was 95% effective, at least in the short term. And then we've learned more. And, and so maybe we have learned that, gee, probably the primary series, you know, we, we could do with a booster. And, and now interesting question will be what happens next? Where are we going to need a fourth dose and beyond that? And we really don't know. Maybe this third dose will complete the series and give us more durable protection. I think that remains to be seen. And we really need to start planning research. And I was advocating this to my NIH colleagues last week for fourth doses be ready in case we see that we're going to need to do that. But it's a great question. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it's more than, it is more than semantics because it might be that at some point we would consider um, just planning to give everybody you know, a three dose regimen, but I think we're not quite there yet. Thank you. Um, how long do you wait after being infected with COVID-19 in order to get the first dose of the vaccine? Yeah, Rebecca, that's a good one. Uh, we have so many folks that get infected and um, I've been asked this question many, many times. And the, the CDC says you could wait up to three months. Well, you really, the important thing is you want the body to have recovered, the immune system to have moved from the acute response into sort of a memory phase. And then if you take the vaccine and take anywhere, if you a month or two after the initial, uh, after recovery, I think is sort of what I say to people. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't wait longer than three months. So a month or two after. What, what's amazing, Rebecca, is then the immune response you see is stronger, better, faster. You have a, a whopping antibody response. If you've had prior infection and then get your vaccine, it's truly amazing. You've are, the immune system's already been primed. It has seen the spike protein on the actual virus. And now when you come in with the RNA that messages the body to make the spike protein, you get a fantastic response. And, and we have data from CDC, from Kentucky, uh, published a couple months ago in MMWR that if you get vaccinated after infection, it reduces your chance of getting a second case of COVID by almost threefold compared to people who don't get vaccinated after COVID infection. So it really, we now have data that show that the vaccine does provide not only that whopping antibody response, which we've seen in my lab and many other labs, but also provides um, better protection than natural immunity. It's better to be vaccinated than to be unvaccinated if you've had prior COVID. You can get it twice, and uh, I'll bet you you can get it three times too. Thank you, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, what if someone got AstraZeneca in Southeast Asia, then immigrated here? What is recommended? Yeah, I've seen this situation and, and uh, know of situations where folks have gone and um, uh, gotten you know, um, uh, a, a, an EUA approved regimen here in the US after getting AZ overseas. I will say this, that AstraZeneca AZ is a, it's like the J and J, it's a, it's a um, common cold virus, the adenovirus, it doesn't multiply in the body, it delivers the DNA, then the RNA messages, just like we talked about. It's a two dose regimen, a month apart. We did a large study of AstraZeneca in our vaccine center, almost a thousand people and it's the most uh, used vaccine on the planet. Around 180 countries, more than that, use the AZ vaccine. So this is gonna happen in an international place like New York. The recommendation, in all likelihood, they're gonna need a booster, I would say. So I think it's not unreasonable for them uh, to go in and, 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 and get a booster. They won't have a card <laughs> that shows they've got you know, AZ, or at least they won't have a US CDC card. So in, you know, in some ways they can just go in and honestly say, I've not had an EUA vaccine and I wanna get that. And they could either probably get one or two doses. I've seen people get two doses of an RNA and anecdotally it's, it's fine, but uh, it's kind of a unique situation. It falls through the cracks a little. The CDC does recognize that people with AZ should be able to get a card and be considered fully vaccinated. I remember uh, Bruce Springsteen was requiring vaccinations and they had to change their um, uh, requirements to allow 
people from uh, UK and elsewhere who were coming over to see him to come into the concert because they, you know, they didn't get an EUA vaccine, but they got a good vaccine. AZ is a, you know, is a fine vaccine. So that would be my recommendation is that, that they go ahead and get a booster if, if they are kind of falling into these categories and um, they shouldn't have any problem getting it would be my guess. Thank you. Um, I would like to know if people are expecting side effects after the booster vaccine. Yeah, thank you for that question. We studied that in our mix and match study, which we presented to CDC, FDA, and uh, two days ago it was presented to the World Health Organization. And the side effects are about the same. And also the studies that were done by the companies with their boosters show that they're no worse, they're roughly the same. Um, you know, and really what we see is mild to moderate. If it's, we're talking about the arm, it's mainly pain or soreness mild to moderate in you know half or three quarters of people, it lasts a day or so and it's gone. You could take some Tylenol or Motrin if you want. And then in terms of systemic, uh, the most common things would be fatigue, malaise, uh, sometimes um, um, a little bit of fever. It's, that's very rare, but about 30, 40% of people may, may feel almost like they have a flu-like illness. But again, mild to moderate uh, and um, goes away in a day or so. So no worse and um, no, you know, it shouldn't be any worse and, and probably would be similar or less to what you had with your first two vaccines. Thank you. Um, next question is, how does getting a mix and, max, mix and match vaccine for your booster shot affect your choice for a fourth shot? Well, now you're out ahead of the curve there, Rebecca. Uh, <laughs> we don't know um, because we're not doing that yet. Uh, but I have talked about it, as you heard me a minute ago. I, I, we may be heading there. And uh, I suspect, that, you know, th this is me now speculating um, because we haven't studied it yet. But this is a, the study I was suggesting is that we go ahead and start doing fourth doses to look for safety, tolerability, and immune responses. So mix and match right now for a, a booster, you know, which would be third or second if it's after RNA or J&J respectively. We know those are safe and well tolerated. We don't know yet for fourth, we really haven't. I, I know of a few people that have gotten fourths and they did fine, that's anecdotal. It needs to be studied and um, whether you do a, a mix and match approach for your third, I, I wouldn't worry about that. I think that mix and match is gonna be here to stay. And even with fourth, if we do them, we'll probably allow mixing and matching would be my guess, but we'll have to study that. Great, thank you. Um, can COVID-19 be transmitted sexually like HIV and AIDS? Not aware of that. Uh, we, you know, we've, we've learned that some viruses that are we don't think of as STIs uh, can be like Ebola um, because it, it can live, the virus can stay, Ebola virus can stay in, in uh, the testes for many years and protect these immune protected spaces. It can also stay in the eye for many years um, and then you know, potentially reactivate. So there are rare cases of sexual transmission with that, um, uh, but um, I have not heard of that. So my answer is gonna be no, not as far as I know. Thank you. Is there any reason why the flu shot is reacting different for someone who has received a COVID vaccine? Yeah, this is very timely because we're in the middle of flu vaccination season. I had mine about three or four days ago. I'm not even sore anymore. Had a little soreness was all with mine. Um, my 89 year old mother just went and got her booster Four days before that, she had her flu shot. Uh, CDC has said you can get your flu shot and your booster on the same day. Uh, there are studies that say that it's okay, it's safe, tolerated, and your antibodies against either flu or COVID are not negatively impacted. So I think it's reasonable to get it at the same time if it's convenient. Some people may prefer not to. They, they may want to you know, stagger them. That's fine too. Um, just don't wait too long to get your flu shot. We don't know what's going to happen with flu this year. Some people have thought we might, because we haven't seen a lot of flu the last year or two with all the masking. And now that 
maybe there's a little less masking, people are wondering if we might see a big rebound of flu since we've kind of lost our natural boosting that occurs all the time with flu season. So it is a good year to get your flu shot. Don't wait too long. And you could take it same day or close to COVID without a problem. Great. Um, do you recommend a booster from the same as the original vaccine or is there an advantage to mix mixing it up? Yeah, thanks for that question. We, uh, in our submitted paper, uh, which is available on uh, Med Archives, if, you're, if you have access to that, uh, the mix and match study, we, we made one really important observation. And that was if you got J&J &J originally and your booster was J&J, &J, um, you had a much lower antibody response after the booster. If you took Pfizer or Moderna for the booster after having had J&J &J originally, you had much higher antibodies. So that was the one where there was a really major difference. Otherwise, all of the different combinations boosted about the same. Um, if, so if you had Moderna originally, Pfizer gave a nice antibody response, vice versa. And J&J &J boosted pretty darn well after um, Pfizer or Moderna, the RNA. So the only one I think that might cause people to pause would be if they got J&J &J originally, um, some people I think looking at the data would feel that, gee, the level of antibody after a J&J &J boost to a J&J &J prime is, just you know, kind of low compared to what you would get if you got a Pfizer or Moderna boost after a J&J &J prime. Now, there's one problem with this, and, and we acknowledge this in our paper, that we only have the antibody data, the T cell data we're waiting on. So J&J &J is a good vaccine. It protects at a very high level, especially against severe disease. So it's a little bit of a head scratcher. Their antibodies are lower, but they, they're protecting against severe disease. Um, it could be that it's the T cells that they have really uh, extraordinary T cell responses that allow them to provide a high level of protection. But I think um, I think that in general with mix and match, if you do mix and match as opposed to getting the same, it, the antibody response is at least as good and or higher. So you could either do the uh, mix and match or do the original. The only one to think twice about might be the J and J prime, you know, whether to get an RNA, which might be better. Um, we don't know that for sure in terms of protection. Our, our study only looked at antibody. T cell data is coming for that. Um, and I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Um, is the composition for the booster different than the original vaccine itself? In other words, are the ingredients included in the booster shot for Pfizer and the other vaccines the same as the first two dose, the first, first two doses? Yeah, it's a good question. The answer is yes and no. Um, it's the same, yes, for Pfizer and for J&J. &J. Moderna is giving a half dose for its booster. So they gave a higher dose for their original series. Uh, they gave 100 micrograms. Remember I told you earlier, Pfizer, 30 micrograms for adults and 10 for kids. Moderna gave 100 micrograms of RNA for their primary. And they've, I think, realized that 50 micrograms might have worked just as well for the primary. And that's what they're going with for their booster. So the dose is a half dose for Moderna. And, and yet, it, you know, if anything, it was the strongest antibody producer in our mix and match study. So I, don't, I wouldn't view that as any kind of problem. There are some uh, formulation changes that may be occurring in the future. And even with the pediatric vaccine to help with storage, this is a huge issue for public health, like many of you. Um, the RNA vaccines have required cold chain that's you know a little difficult, challenging. They, in, in the kids vaccine, they're changing the buffer from PBS to TRIS, and that allows for eight week storage in the refrigerator, which is, is pretty cool for an RNA vaccine. I hope I'm remembering that right. It's in the, it was in the FDA presentation yesterday. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mulligan. And I'll have one last question for you. So is it fair to say if you test positive for COVID with no symptoms, then can you get the vaccine with less wait time? Um, no, I think I'd wait a month 
the, the same answer. And the reason being, you know, I said when you're fully recovered, so I'd say a month from, you know, roughly from your incubation period, because it, it's what it, when I say that, and I did say, I, I want the immune system to become quiescent, to move from the peak activation of the immune system that occurs in the first couple of weeks, and then it starts coming down as lymphocytes contract from effectors into memory. I want you to be in memory before you get your um, vaccine after natural COVID. And so even if it's asymptomatic, I'd wait a month at least. Thank you so much for your answers, Dr. Mulligan. You're very welcome. Uh, they were great questions. I really enjoyed it. Thanks to everybody that asked a question and tuned in. We actually, thank you so much, Dr. Mulligan and Rebecca for that excellent moderating um, and to everyone for joining us. I know we did not get to a lot of the questions in the Q&A. Um, thank you everybody for submitting your questions. And I really do, you know, some of these questions are really um, detailed and sort of medical in nature. I really do encourage folks to reach out to their primary care physician or to just, uh, you know, a physician um, if you're having concerns about your own health, um, if, if it's... Um, you know, more just sort of general knowledge that you're interested in, you can always email us here um, and, and we can um, send some questions back to Dr. Mulligan um, uh, for, um, for him to respond to. So please feel free to reach out to Dina or myself um, uh, if you have questions that, that we weren't able to get to today. Um, there is a quick poll um, that should be up on your screen. We'd greatly appreciate you responding. Um, to the four questions, if you scroll down. Um, and I did also want to put up, also say thank you so much to um, Sarah Hussein, who's helping us on the, on the back end, um, and to um, Jennifer Phillip and Michelle Fang and Dr. Mulligan's office, um, and all the folks here in our Department of Population Health who have been helping us put on these webinars. Um, I did want to put a plug in for, um, we have an upcoming webinar on November 18th at 11 o'clock. We don't have the registration information for that yet, but it will be um, on pregnancy, maternal and child health and vaccines. Um, Dr. Terry Ann Bennett from NYU will be um, uh, on that panel along with um, somebody from the Department of, uh, the New York City Department of Health, uh, Dr. Michelle Morrison will have a doula. Um, on that panel as well. So we hope folks can join us. We'll send you out that information. Um, thanks so much for joining us. And thank you again so much, Dr. Mulligan and Rebecca. I just, it's been so important to get timely information out to folks as, as uh, things are changing so quickly all the time. Really appreciate your time and sharing with the communities. And thank you, Dina too. I didn't thank Dina, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I forget anything, Dina? No, I think that's it. Um, yeah, please take a moment to fill out the poll. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.